This meeting is being recorded. Good evening and welcome to Slam the Gavel, the show that tells it all regarding family court, other court issues, as well as CPS. I'm your host, Marianne Petrie, and there is a non-denominational retreat weekend at the Resolution Center of Jacksonville, Florida. This will be a time of support and renewal for parents and grandparents in the journey of parental alienation. Standing strong in resilience, paving the way for good health and a great future. This parental alienation retreat is on April 22nd through the 24th, 2022 in Jacksonville, Florida. And I will put all the notes in the podcast notes. Oh, I've got a new guest. His name is Kevin Annette. He is from Canada. He is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee in 2013. He's a community minister, human rights consultant, and field secretary for the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State, award-winning documentary filmmaker, unrepentant in 2007, and an author. He has been an ordained as clergyman into United Church of Canada, 1990, held three pastoral positions, including the minister of St. Andrew's United Church, Port Alberni, 1992 to 1995, fired without cause and expelled from ministry without due process in 1995 to 1997 after publicly exposing the death of Aboriginal children and land left land theft by the United Church, organized the first public inquiry into crimes in Canadian Indian residential schools, co-sponsored by United Nations affiliate IHRAAM, June 12th through the 14th in 1998 in Vancouver. He established the first permanent body to further his inquiry, September 2000, Vancouver. The Truth Commission into Genocide in Canada appointed acting secretary. He published his first account of crimes of genocide in Indian residential schools, February 2001. It's called The Hidden from History, the Canadian Holocaust, third edition, established friends and relatives of the disappeared Vancouver and Toronto, 2005 to 2010. He led church occupied occupations and national conferences into missing Aboriginal children. He forced Canadian government an apology for Indian residential schools, June 2008. He co-founded the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State, ITCCS, June 15, 2010, with six other organizations, appointed ITCCS field secretary, led public protests and exorcism at the Vatican, 2009, 2010, ITCCS endorsed by radical party and other politicians in Rome, Co-founded International Common Law Court of Justice, Spring 2011, Brussels, served as chief advisor to the prosecutor's office, launched first common law court case against the Vatican, the Crown of England, Canada, and its churches for crimes of genocide, 2012 to 2013. His publications are Love and Death in the Valley, First Books, 2001. Hidden from History, the Canadian Holocaust, 2001, 2005, 2010, self-published editions. Hidden No Longer, Genocide in Canada, Past, Present, 2010, self-published. Unrepentant, Disrobing the Emperor Books, Amazon.com, 2011. I will put his websites and contact in the podcast notes, and I welcome you, Kevin Annette, to the show. I'm proud to have you on the show. It's good to be here. Thanks very much. So we have a lot to talk about. You've done a great body of work throughout these years. Right. Well, I mean, you know, considering the audience, uh, it's very relevant because it really started about issues of uh, child abuse, child abduction, and the things I was encountering as a minister, um, not just against Aboriginal children, but against a lot of children. And uh, I went through the experience myself when the church fired me. They went to my ex-wife and offered to pay for her divorce if she'd leave me because I was stumbling over huge crimes that church had committed, land theft, genocide, things that are being you know, people are more aware of now because mm -hmm. partly because of the work I was doing. But um, in the course of it, they, uh, I lost uh, my two daughters in a divorce and custody battle, went through all of that pain. And in fact, well, that's one of the reasons I was accepted into the Aboriginal Healing Circle, because they could see I was suffering personally. I had paid a price. And it was through that 
that experience that I became a lot more sensitive to, you know, what so many parents go through when, you know, for me, it was being targeted as a whistleblower, but a lot of other people, they, I've experienced up close what parental alienation means, uh, because it was part of my alienation for my whole culture, you know, for, for exposing this crime. So, um, you know, it's really important to share each other's experiences about that because that's how we, we gain strength together and able to endure these things. And it's very dis- difficult when you are targeted as a whistleblower and then you're, they just totally come after you and your whole life falls apart. And they oh, yeah. turn your it children against you. Yeah. Yes, I can't imagine what you went through. Also, well, with, you know, it was. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, it, the, the the whole experience allowed me to see my culture really for the first time, um, and the people around me. Like you find out who your friends and enemies are when you're when you're going through something like that, and all sorts of new friends and new family came about. I was pretty much ostracized by my whole family because of what I was bringing out, Um, you know, mass murder by church and state over more than a century, you know, more than 60,000 children died in these facilities um, deliberately. I mean, they were taking children, exposing them to tuberculosis and letting them die en masse. Um, All of that evidence is at murderbydecree.com online uh, and in many of my books. But, um, and so even my own children, I mean, I have two daughters and they're, in their early thirties, not late twenties, early thirties. And we're still, you know, very close, but they are estranged from me in the same way that a lot of Canadians are in that if they accept the stuff I was bringing out, they have to challenge, they have to question their whole way of life, their whole history their you know, and it's, it's easier just to shun one person than to do, do that. Right. Even in a family. So maybe especially in a family. So I, I know what it means to be a black sheep that was unearned, right. It's just kind of this, this unfairness and cruelty that falls in the out of, out of the blue. And the hardest part for a parent, of course, is to navigate that while keeping strong and looking at the long run. I mean, that's what I often say to people, keep the long-term view. How do you want to be known to your children 10, 20, 30 years from now? Um, and the, the state, unfortunately, is a big child trafficker. We've learned that, you know, the, the biggest amount of child trafficking abuse goes on within the fam- so-called family welfare system and family court system. And that's another thing that our tribunal has been documenting a lot in recent years. The extent of child trafficking that goes on is phenomenal, as you probably know. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so that's a whole issue. But it's really genocide under international law because what people don't realize is that when you read the United Nations Convention on Genocide, one of the, they have five definitions of what it means to commit genocide, to wipe out a whole group of people. And one of those definitions is t- uh, taking their ch- taking children from their family and putting them in another family. Well, by that definition, the whole foster care system and parental alienation, that's all genocide because it's destroying families. Mm-hmm. It's destroying the foundation of a society. So that's what, you know, when I say to people, look, your fight is for many of us because it's challenging the, an ongoing system of genocide and destruction that, that exists, right? Definitely. And people don't know the extent of this until it happens to them. Yep. Yeah. Right. I don't know if you, you know, like you try to explain your story and people are, you know, they just don't get it. They will, they'll walk away from you. You know, they just don't understand. Yep. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's not a comfortable issue, of course. Mm -hmm. child abuse and the loss of one's children it's i find it's easier to go out and protest things that are thousands of miles away or are pretty abstract and not connected to your own life we automatically do that unconsciously as human beings we avoid you know i see this in grief counseling and and at deathbeds all the time people just naturally avoid brutal things and endings because our culture doesn't really teach people to deal with suffering and death Mm -hmm. and ending it's a frightening topic for people and doesn't have to be it's just part of the great cycle and right. you know when a society ends and when when a societies fall apart like we're witnessing you know um it's the same deal except on a mass scale and the level of rage and you know I look at what goes on now in america and and in canada too but 
it, the whole kind of civil war between Democrats and Republicans. And that's, you know, th that's a sign of when people are in a huge panic mm -hmm. and they turn on each other, right? And I think, you know, there's different reasons for that, but I, you see it up close in families. It's kind of like big scale, small scale, it's the same thing, right? It's easier mm -hmm. to scapegoat attack an individual than look at a sickness, right? Right, right. They don't want to acknowledge that, say, parental alienation even exists. Yeah. And that's very damaging to the parents that are experiencing parental alienation. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. As a lot of your listeners know, I know. Um, also, the courts, at least in Canada, I'm just speaking from the Canadian experience, but uh, they don't even recognize PAS in the court system. They have no counselors or psychologists present in court when your, family, your life has been ripped apart and you've seen your children taken from you. You know, it's, it's designed to increase the suffering because it's, it's lucrative for the lawyers and the, and the social workers. And there's a whole industry that feeds off our suffering. So why would they stop it? Right? It's like doctors. It's like, you know, these <laughs> days I call it the sickness industry. Doctors don't really cure you. They sustain you to milk you for money. And, you know, it's the same in the court system very much, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, they definitely keep the cases going with continuances or, you know, the judge wants to reconvene yeah. in three months. They just drag yeah. it out and make these parents pay astronomical fees. Yeah, it's unconscionable, really. And, mm -hmm. and so we often say, look, to the degree that you can work it out among yourselves, mm -hmm. let's have community solutions to this so that children don't even have to be estranged in the first place. Right. And in a lot of cases you can do that, but I've, it happened to me, the lawyers on both sides were egging us on, were, were, you know, saying, if you do the right thing, I'll get you your kids, you know, um, just the big lie. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is when you're working with a high conflict personality disorder, that's when, you know, you, you can't mediate with them. No. You, you get sucked into the family court system and you just have to run the, run the gauntlet until you get out. Oh yeah, I know. And it's, it's, uh, it's running the gauntlet literally is what it is, you know, running past people who are going to whack you. Um, you know, that actually reminds me of, of a story about uh, when I was early on in the healing circles with these native people who went through these death camps they call Indian schools. And by the way, you had them in America as well, all over mm -hmm. the place. Um, same deal. It wasn't, um, they weren't church run primarily, but same level of suffering and mass graves. And that's just beginning to be looked at in America. It's, it's mm -hmm. part of the job I do, actually. I'm, I work with people mm -hmm. in your country to do that. But um, one of the stories that an older woman told me was that when she spoke her language, the priests lined up all the children with uh, sticks. And she had to run down this gauntlet. And another girl who preceded her was actually killed by that. And they buried her and told the kids not to talk about it. And you know what? I heard the same stories. It was the first, the first group in um, uh, South Dakota. They were suing the Catholic Church for uh, same kind of crimes. And um, they even found a mass grave near Chamberlain, South Dakota. Uh, and one of these Catholic Indian schools is still operating, believe it or not. But they went to the FBI and the FBI wouldn't, wouldn't investigate. They said, well, we'd have to get permission of the Catholic Church. And I said to the, the Fed, well, since when do you go to the serial killer to ask for permission for digging under his house, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, it shows you at that level, church, state, like it's all very arranged and you, the crimes are not allowed to be brought out. That's why we need our own investigations. And that's why we set up this tribunal in Europe and the common law court. And, you know, the work since then that actually allows the citizens to put the system on trial. And you actually, America is the only country in the world, actually, that in its constitution allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just, uh, the, the corruption is so deep. And yeah. like you said, what, why does the FBI have to go to the Vatican? Uh, you know, it's just mishandled. Everything has been mishandled. It's, it appears there's no justice. Well, in fact, for an ordinary person without a lot of money, there isn't, mm -hmm. unless you make an incredible stink and never give up, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to do that. And I was fortunate. I had a lot of evidence. I had a lot of eyewitnesses. And um, 
they, the year I got fired, they actually, um, the government was forced to start kind of a um, very limited lawsuit to try to contain the issue. But then because of the work we did, it got out of hand and it blew up. And, you know, it eventually led to us forcing Pope Benedict from office. It just mushroomed into a huge global movement that's still there. Mm -hmm. um, because it's so big, the crime is so big, there's so many people suffering, but we're also isolated. Everyone feels on their own. They don't know who to connect to. Um, and of course, lawyers and the government and you know the, the criminals prey on all that, right? Mm -hmm. People are looking for a solution uh, as far as you know, getting cases done quickly instead of dragging them out for four years or eight years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just seems very difficult to find a solution for all of this. Yeah, because there's collusion, of course, mm -hmm. at every level. Of, one of the, uh, you may or may not know this, but the, um, one of the things that we found out years ago, both in America and Canada, is that um, it goes by different names, but CAS, CPS, you know, Child mm -hmm. Protection or Children's Aid Society, they usually have kind of a parallel system set up in it whereby you've got a whole network of child trafficking going on. So you have social workers, police, um, judges, lawyers, politicians, they're all in the network. They have their own code words, they have their own system. And no, for example, no policeman is gonna rat out another cop. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's like judges, it's a closed kind of old boys network. And a minority is doing it, but a lot of the others know what's going on, but they turn a blind eye. And so the children literally can go missing and and it's erased from the records. We find that especially in the foster care system. And you know, the statistics show your f a child is far more likely to be abused and traumatized in a foster home than in their own you know, biological home. But it's the case, like for example, in Canada, a, mo a single mom on social assistance gets only half of what a foster parent would get. Well, shouldn't it be the other way around? Mm -hmm. Why? Why wouldn't the mother, on her own, get more assistance than some foster family who make a lot of money by basically it's a it's a child farming industry, right? Really, it's a form of slavery and human trafficking, and um, you know, so it it, it we got to look at it in that light and, and not use the language or the uh, the way they the system looks at it because it's all these things. It's like when they talk about child abuse; it's a very mild word. And the words are designed to soften the crime and, and make it almost seem normal. Um, so we have to just get people to use the language and words that reflect what's really going on, which is human slavery, you mm -hmm. know, torture. Mm -hmm. You know, even when you are in family court and the judge hands over the kids to the other parent, that too yeah. is human trafficking. Yep. to some extent. And um, also, um, oh, it, it, it escapes me now, but, you know, they're taking these kids, putting them in foster care, drugging them up. And oh, yeah. in the state of Missouri, I guess we had like around, I think it was eight to eight to 900 children missing and no one no, knows where they went mm -hmm. and nothing has been investigated. Nobody cares. Yeah, well well, it won't be because they've been officially erased because they're, they're being trafficked. Mm -hmm. And the whole system is designed to hide that. Uh, just like in Canada, there was, I don't know if you remember last year, but there was a, a, a mass grave of children found at a Kamloops Indian school. It made the news all over. Well, we had been investigating that for over 20 years. We published lists of mass graves in, in 2002 uh, that was totally ignored by the media. But now this one dig was highlighted because the Royal Canadian amount of police have gone in there to do what they normally do, which is to destroy one of these mass grave sites because of all the incriminated evidence. Well, one of the guys on the Native Bank Council found out about it and leaked it to the press. So the government then sent them to look like plastic fact. They, they uh, rope off the site. They don't let anyone in. They basically destroy the remains. They never say what's there. Uh, and then finally, about a year later, they say, oh, yeah, we didn't find anything. Well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like asking Al Capone in Chicago what he found when he swept the lake to see if there's anybody who'd been dumped there, right? It, when the criminal is in charge, you can't trust anything, any so-called investigation they do. So um, the whole thing about 
it being genocide when children are lost in a family court, it's, it's, a, it's a big industry. Think of the amount of money made off those children, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we even found out that the, the Catholic Church has a system that operates in hospitals all over North America. It's called BFA, Baby for Adop uh, BFA, I'm sorry, Baby for Adoption Protocol. Mm -hmm. So the Catholic Church has a deal with all these child adoption agencies and frankly, hospitals that need children, just organs, this is kind of gross, it's true. Mm -hmm. um, they have a quota they need to fulfill every year. So they go to young girls in the Catholic church who are pregnant and they say, give us your child, we'll raise your child. They put child, uh, these ca the pregnant Catholic girls in, in special homes mm -hmm. and they isolate them from their family. They, they give them uh, lactation suppressants, they give them all these drugs, like you say, drug them up and brainwash them to surrender the child. And the child, when they're still in the uterus, they're trafficked, right? Mm -hmm. And so as soon as they're born, they don't even let the mother hold her new whisker away, the child away, and you never see them again. And this is a whole racket going on, institutionalized. And that's why, you know, the Catholic Church is never, when they're sued, they always keep the, 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 and bind the lower level priests and never allow a cardinal or a, a bishop or the pope to be put on trial because even though they're the ones who authorize these things it's their policy in the catholic church it's been in in place for almost a century that when children are harmed the police are never to be told and everyone is silenced and you're excommunicated if you talk about it you know i mean it, it's a system a criminal conspiracy and it's by the biggest and oldest corporation on the planet well if it's going on in the church think of how prevalent it is everywhere else i mean mm -hmm. it's it's anyway it it's an example of how you can't get justice in the system you've got to create that justice yourself and that's what our common law courts are really all about and even the the common law courts they're not doing their jobs either no. you know the existing ones yeah we mm -hmm. what um you see, in Canada, we've had to work outside the so-called crown jurisdiction. The crown is the, the perpetrator of crimes and against, you know, Native people in these, you know, residential schools. Um, and so we actually created, seven years ago, we set up a um, framework for a republic in Canada outside crown jurisdiction. And those republics, uh, local assemblies, set up courts under their jurisdiction. So... Um, in America, you can actually do the same thing. There was a really uh, inspiring case in Pennsylvania a number of years ago. The, um, there was in uh, Pennsylvania General Energy Company wanted to, they wanted to go into rural Pennsylvania and dump this wastewater from fracking on, into the water system of this community. It would have poisoned the water system. So all seven, it was in uh, Grant Township, uh, Pennsylvania, from the central Pennsylvania. And all the people got together and in the Pennsylvania state constitution, it says people have the right to pass what are called uh, home rule charters. So they can charter together and say, we are, we are passing our own local law that nullifies this order. Well, these are Democrats and Republicans. They joined hands. They passed their, this ordinance that say we nullify that. The state, uh, the court system, the government, PGE, they all fought them, but they won in the end, because that's in the, their constitution. That's the right of every American. If the courts and the governments are working against them, they can set up their own sovereign courts like they can set up their own sovereign governments. They have the right to, like it says, the right to overthrow your own government if it's, if it's acting as a tyrannical body. Um, and so it's right in the American bloodstream to do that, right? But we've forgotten that. I mean, how often is that ever taught to children in schools that, that citizens have that right? Because, you know, we're dealing less and less with governments and more with huge mega corporations like um, the whole big pharma th th system that's running government policy now on, on the whole COVID shots, right? Um, and the media. And it, it's so we have an obligation now to create, re kind of recreate America, recreate our things that we've forgotten about that we have the power to do innately, you know. It's born in us. It's unalienable, to quote the U.S. Right, Declaration right. of Independence, right? Unalienable. Mm -hmm. Can't take it from us. Yeah, the unalienable rights. 
but they're working very hard to do that, <laughs> to take it away. Yeah, but they can't. Remember in the, you know, the, the wording of the Constitution, Congress will enact no law that violates these fundamental liberties. You know, they can pass something, but, you know, the courts can then knock it down. Mm -hmm. If the courts don't, then we can. That's the point. It doesn't end with corrupt courts. It, it, we can recreate that. That's what the grand juries are in America, traditionally. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court calls them a fourth arm of government where a grand jury consists, consisting of citizens can investigate something and recommend that a trial be convened uh, because of criminal activity. Well, that's like what we did with our tribunal in Europe and in Canada. We convened our own investigation and it, had, it forced Pope Benedict and three other cardinals from office when the verdict came in. Mm -hmm. Because you know, other courts can then issue arrest warrants and that based on a citizen investigation. People don't know they have that power under international law and the law of America, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. People don't really know what their rights are. Uh, it, and yeah. sometimes things are so hidden, people can't find their laws. Mm -hmm. That's really, right. And, uh, well, I remember uh, somebody, in my friend of mine in Minneapolis, she works with farmers there in the Midwest who were um, trying to have a judge removed because he was issuing, this was almost 10 years ago now, but he was issuing f uh, fake um, eviction orders against farmers in collusion with mortgage companies who wanted their land, right? Mm -hmm. So they documented all this. They got the federal marshal in Minneapolis to come and, and arrest the, the judge and it happened. But then they faced a consequence because they were part of a movement among the farmers called Restore the Republic. And the government, the attorney general targeted them big time, accused them of uh, uh, forging government insignias. And a bunch of them went off to jail in Duluth, Minnesota for like six years sentence or something. So they tend to go after people who exercise their sovereignty, but they didn't have a lot of exposure. If you have enough as I've shown in my life, you have enough exposure, you can move mountains mm -hmm. and you don't give up, right? Right. And that's the thing people have to realize is they have to be persistent and yep. knock on many doors and not quit. Right. And when there's, you know, a lot of children involved and children being trafficking, and, you know, and this is very big right now with the child trafficking and uh, missing children and no one's looking for them. And people are outraged, but yet nothing is really happening. Well, it's, it's kind of like having an, uh, a muscle that you've never exercised. Mm -hmm. Your sense of, uh, I guess one word for it is self-governance, you know, that, uh, that I can... I can act in my own name and I don't have to depend on a Congress person, uh, a judge somewhere. Uh, even the term representative, right? Um, it means to represent something or someone, right? Uh, and it's not, it went in the Republican Canada, in Canada, we call it Canada. Um, we have delegates. So uh, when you elect someone, it doesn't mean you hand over your authority to them. It means they rep they act in your name on certain issues. But if they don't, you have the right to remove them. It's like a contract. If you're an egg on the contract, bang, it's over. And why shouldn't government operate that way too? Why should we hand over power to people who are then totally unaccountable and can bring in a police state, which is what they're, what they're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it applies, especially what greater cause to fight in than to protect our own children and other children from this. And, you know, one thing I learned, my, my youngest daughter, Eleanor, she's studying human rights law now and um, kind of a chip off the old block. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons she's so sensitive to that is because of what she went through with me, right? Mm -hmm. And um, she was outraged at what was going on. But as a child, she could do anything. But that planted seed. And now, 30 years old, it's blossomed and she's, her life has been changed. So we have to see the good aspect of the pain and suffering we go through with our children, it makes them aware of and, and it makes them a better person the lower run. So we shouldn't shy away from, I know it's a strange thing to hear for the first time, but to shy away from suffering means you miss the lesson it brings mm -hmm. and the lesson it can teach our children about they need to fight for each other and stand for yourself and don't go along when it's wrong, right? 
Definitely. Uh, and hopefully, you know, when they are going through this, they're old enough to see what's happening, but yet they can't do anything about it. And hopefully, at, like your daughter, as she got older, then now she's doing something about it. Yeah, well, Eleanor was only three. Oh. When uh, the church went to Anne, my ex-wife, and said, look, we'll pay you if you leave this guy. It was part of the whole, you know, blacklisting and targeting of me. Uh, that's the first thing, you know, for you are targeted when you're a parent and you take on the system. And the two ways they come at your first, well, they come in three ways. They come at the people around you who you depend on. They start spreading smears and lies about you to them to make you seem crazy or whatever. Uh, they go after your income and they go after your your um, your children. So livelihood, family, and credibility, they attack all three. And mm -hmm. one of the books I wrote is, it's called A Manual for Whistleblowers. And all of my books you can see on Amazon under Kevin Annett. But um, this manual goes into kind of tried and true methods that a bigger adversary uses to try to crush you, you know whether you're a whistleblower or whether you're just somebody challenging their system and uh really urge people to read that because it 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 uh goes into the hard experiences um of what i and other people go through when you know um it, it's really psychological warfare they try to they don't have to throw your jelly they try to get you here and mm -hmm. get you to yourself and and uh, trust the people who are in the process of of destroying your life you know it's that whole thing so we got to learn these lessons to know you know the old saying uh, for uh, warned is forearmed mm -hmm. we have to learn before these things happen to us because in the in the heat of the moment i remember when i when they showed up and and the, the divorce papers and custody papers were served on me i was in a total panic i wasn't thinking straight mm -hmm. and you go through that that it's like when you learn learning that you're dying you have that that shock and denial period and you're frozen your mind doesn't work you're, you don't know what to do and you can be very easily manipulated and then people show up and say here hire me i'll get your kids back and thirty thousand dollars later you mm -hmm. don't have your children right right so i mean it's, it's that they exploit you in your vulnerability and and the first stage is you are very vulnerable and that's why you need a support group and other people who've been through it to be mm -hmm. helping you at that time to protect you right and there's not a whole lot of people that want to protect you. Like we encourage having court watchers. Mm -hmm. And I don't right. know if in Canada you yeah. have closed, you know, family court is a, like closed. No one else is allowed in, just yep. pro the parties. Usually, yeah. Oh, that's bad because, I mean, here, you know, sometimes it's closed or they allow people in and we encourage people to support the, the target parent going through this by having court watchers. That's good. Um, because of course people are embarrassed. They don't want, and the lawyer will say to them, Oh, look, your, your ex-husband or wife are, are going to mention all sorts of kind of dirty things about you. Are you sure you want people to hear all that? Um, mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, they use those tactics, but you know, we shouldn't be afraid of talking about anything going on because it's, it's, you need, like you say, our real strength is shining the public limelight on these things, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, you know, I know people have jobs and, you know, but if you can gather whoever you can gather to come in with you, because sometimes people just go in with their parents. Oh, no. Yeah. It's not good. Or the opposing side shows up with a huge entourage and, you know, and yep. the judge looks at that and they start favoring. Yep. Oh yeah, it's true. Yeah, and um, it, it, you know it, the thing is, people do complain about judges over here, and they'll write up complaints, but they really go nowhere. They all protect each other, right? Because the judges, right? So I know that in America, some levels of the judiciary are elected; um, the higher levels aren't. But you don't have any elected judges in Canada. They're all crown appointees. They're all political appointees, and talk about an old boys club uh, you know there there's a judicial review committee where if you have a complaint against a judge you send it but it's all run by judges right <laughs> it's like gee let's see i wonder if they're going to convict one of their own mm -hmm. you know versus mm -hmm. some poor person uh complained about them so i mean it's a rigged game but that's all the more reason to create our own response to it right our own 
eventually our own courts that the people control. That's what John Adams said, one of the founding fathers, second U.S. president. He said the people must control their own courts because if they don't, we'll have tyranny. An mm -hmm. independent court system is our only guarantee for liberty, you know, because it's a check and balance on the government, right, for one mm -hmm. thing. Definitely, because um, I'm half American, have... by the way. Maybe you can tell. Oh yes, my, <laughs> my dad's uh, American. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Canadians are afraid of criticizing their government so, or a government. Well, you have to speak up, and people, you know, you have your First Amendment rights over here, you know, and you have yeah. to speak up on this corruption going on, not only to yourself as a target parent, but to your children and with this foster care as well as CPS. I, yep. they're, they're granted way too much power as well oh, as the Catholic yeah. church. <laughs> well, I know there, you know, as a matter of fact, when uh, in Ontario, in Eastern Canada, we were investigating the child aid system, CAS, Children Aid Society. It turns out it's not even an arm of the government. It's a private company. They're registered offshore. You can't know who's running them. And they are given as much as $30,000 for every child they take out of a home and put in a foster home. Well, it's a child trafficking network. And these people, these CES frontline uh, workers, they're not trained anywhere. They're just people they hire, mm -hmm. right? And they have the power of the police. The police often escort them in and just grab these children. And I mean, it's, it's criminal, and yet it's got the stamp of government on it, so everyone thinks it's legitimate when they, they're not. They're like, a lot of agencies in the government are actually private companies, like prisons in America. Mm -hmm. Private, you know, prisons for profit. Well, they need people in there, you know, it's more profitable. So no wonder there's someone in 9 million Americans in prison, right? It's a big mm -hmm. industry, just like child trafficking. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, it's, they've got to re remove these incentives like we have Title IV D, B, and E, and and Title IV B is for foster care, and uh, that it's all it's just got to go. It's I feel yeah. the family court should be abolished as well as CPS. Mm -hmm. Have something else installed in place of that um, that's monitored with um, well, highly educated people. <laughs> well, I often say to people, kind of work out a model what you would like, create it yourself and then start operating it, you know, mm -hmm. in your community, uh, parallel. And when you create something, the government has to run behind you. Like you never go like, um, for example, we have arrest warrants based on court verdicts in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and we never go to the police first. We, with help, we just do it. And then the police will show up and we educate them. We say, look, um, you can't object to our citizen arrests of these known child raping priests, because if you do, you're aiding and abetting a convicted criminal. And at that point, the police always stand back. You know, if, if the police intervene in something very lawful that you're doing, they're obstructing justice. Mm -hmm. and they can go to jail themselves for doing it. So know the law and know your natural rights. And then when you're armed that way, they target people a lot less when they know that you know the law, right? Mm -hmm. Right, you know, even, as you had just mentioned with, you know, the police, educate the police and, you know, let them know that they are uh, accomplices to this, as well as, you, you know, we've got judges that are accomplices that are yeah. child abusers in black robes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Kenneth Gottfried, but he's written three books. And um, hmm. one of them is, I believe, child abusers in black robes. Yeah. And that's what they are. And they're, oh. and they're getting away from it. And so are these attorneys. They're just as guilty yeah. Yeah. for the destruction. If, you make, if, if there's any group in society that are essentially above the law, can't be touched, whether it's, you know, priest, <laughs> pope, attorney, president, um, you know, judge, then they, it will be corrupt. It will, it's, it, it will attract those people. Imagine, okay, so the Catholic Church, they have a policy that when children are raped, they're not, uh, it's not to be reported. What kind of person is that going to attract? Any child rapist knows they can become a Catholic priest and would be protected by as far up as Rome. They have a policy saying you'll be protected if you rape children. Well, it's that's going to be a, a green light to every, you know, child rapist in the world to get get ordained as a priest. 
you know, and the conviction rate is less than 1%. And even those convicted never go to jail. They're just put into another parish somewhere. It's criminal. It's like <laughs> aiding and abetting genocide right. and murder against children. Because, you know, people use the word child abuse, but it's not abuse. It's soul murder. You know, when you crush a child at a young age, it's, it's crushing them for life. And it should be a crime. You know, in, in Canada, they just lowered the mandatory sentence for child rape from five years to 18 months. Mm. That's all you have to do. You rape a child and you're never convicted the first time. You have to do it five or 10 times before they get a conviction. Then maximum sentence, 18 months. I mean, it, it's more of a crime to own a marijuana plant than to rape, rape a child in Canada. And if you look in, I'm sure various states have the same kinds of, you know, help the child rapist statute, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's unconscionable, yet why would it go on if there was justice operating in the system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just uh, just very disgusting. And these kids are helpless. And you'll even have a child tell the judge what's going on. And the judge doesn't care. He'll just yep. go along with whatever it takes to, I don't know, oh, yeah. entertain the false narrative. Well, I don't want to make it all doom and gloom. Because, I mean, hearing this stuff, people can get very discouraged. And I like talking about my story because it's an example of how you can fight back and win. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, we forced the Canadian government to admit, and the churches, to admit to, these gen to the genocide in residential school. Even last year, the Prime Minister Trudeau said, yes, it was genocide. Well, I mean, at that point, there should have been a war crimes trial convened in Canada, mm -hmm. and he should have been arrested for making that. That's the UN law. It says if you admit or it's proven to commit genocide, the country has to be prosecuted and punished. And yet they weren't. So yeah, they know they can say these things and they're protected by their office for now at least. But the point is that didn't happen accidentally. It's because a bunch of us just never gave up. We were occupying churches. We we're bringing out the truth. We we're going to the mass grave sites. We we're educating people. And 10, 15 years later, it paid off, right? So mm -hmm. You can't do something over weeks or months. It's years long, right? Mm -hmm. But once you devote your life, your whole life and the life of your children and others to this, you can begin to move mountains. But people, you know, we're, ra we're raised in kind of a three-second soundbite, take a pill, get fixed culture. Things don't work that way in practice. The, this is a long struggle, and we have to, you know, kind of gird ourselves for that because otherwise you give up in frustration, and there's no reason to give up. We can't give up when it's about the lives of our children. You've got to be seriously persistent. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, it, because it's, it's so worth fighting for. It, and like you said, it could take 10 years, but it has yeah. to be done because it will save someone else's life. Well, and, and you know, the awareness in, in the world today about child trafficking and child abuse, if you look 15 20 years ago, none of that was there, but we started a whole campaign that burst outside Canada, went over to Europe, convicted the Pope, uh, forced all this change, and then we gradually saw the whole issue seeping into the public awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And that started out of, out of Canada, a few other places that we were working with, but just a citizen-based movement, there were never more than a few dozen of us, just a lot of us kind of fairly poor, <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. a lot of native people on the ground, but we didn't have any special power. It just we were standing on the truth. We had hard evidence, and we never gave up. Mm -hmm. And we hit at like uh, I often quote Sun Tzu in the Art of War. He says, "Always hit your enemy where they're weak, never mm -hmm. where they're strong." Because we're like a guerrilla movement. We can mm -hmm. outmaneuver and outthink this big enemy, right? And right. Um, always go after where they're weak. So we went in Sunday mornings into churches because they're too like any corporation or government churches are worried about two things, their money and their public image. Mm -hmm. And so we went in a, uh, and went after both and they buckled. I mean, within a week of us launching, we had in 2008, we did all these church occupations on Sundays and we started talking about the mass graves of where these children are that the, the Catholic, the Anglican, the United churches had all killed. And within a week of us doing that, boom, the government started talking about apologies and investigations well that's not a coincidence it's because 
the church has gone on the phone to the government and say, stop this, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's right at Easter. We planned it to happen right at Easter when, when they're kind of their big holiday is right. Mm -hmm. And they panicked, you know, the mm -hmm. biggest corporation in the world panicked and buckled because they hit a, a, where they're vulnerable. So that's a lesson for anyone that, you know, the enemy always seems like they're huge, but they're not mm -hmm. in practice. They're just people. Mm -hmm. And you can get to the the police used to show up and I could see tears in the eyes of some of these cops. We were reading out the names of children who had been killed, but it happened to them, right? And these cops, we got to their hearts, right? And to helping us. I used to get calls from cops tipping off about stuff. So, you know, we have the moral high ground and we have to use that. We can't get demoralized by this, the, the, the illusion of the power of, you know, the state and the church and all that, because it's really built on sand. It's built on crime. It's built on fear and ignorance. Mm -hmm. like, which we can overcome. Mm -hmm. And with Sun Tzu, Art of War, uh, he also said to attack your enemy when they're tired. Watch your enemy get tired. And so when, when you were yes. talking about the names of these right. children and the police had tears in their eyes, they were, they were tired. You know? And I think that yeah. it's yeah. good to read that book, too. Um, <laughs> Because the way the enemy was I, at the back of that, yeah, the at the uh, the whistleblower manual that I talked about, and I also produced a common law training manual where it kind of gives you a description of how to set up common law courts and citizen investigations. But in there, at the back of both books, I print fifty excerpts from Sun Tzu on the award that are relevant about how to outmaneuver a bigger enemy, um, you know, and allow yourself. This is another important thing. Allow yourself and your group to be forced into an unescapable situation because when you can't escape, that's when you fight harder. It's when people have options and you never do this. You never force your enemy into a corner because that makes them even more determined. You give them a way out. You give that you go and negotiate and say, okay, we'll do this, but you got to do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but for us too, I find this is proven all the time. When people are, have no other option and they know have, they have to fight, or they'll lose their kids or their own life is at stake, then see an amazing thing come out of people and the termination that isn't there in days because we always have this expect, we always run our life according to a kind of a win lose kind of a, a scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we judge things according to how much we're going to lose versus how much we win. But when you, the scale is gone and you know you're just going to lose, then what, what can you do but fight and, mm -hmm. and fight to the end? And that's the power they can't overcome, right? And that's what, you know, parents are trying to do. You know, they're, they're having, um, you know, at the courthouses, they're holding signs. They're, you know, yep. showing the corruption, you know, at least teaching the people about the corruption. You know, before you go into this family courtroom, this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah, good. And, Good. That's um, a that's a first. That's a really important first step to do those kind of protests and educations. Uh, the thing is, though, psychologically, when you think about it, a protest is asking for something. Okay, mm -hmm. it's it's looking to the system to give you something, and if the system says no, go away. What do you do? You're then powerless. They've fed mm -hmm. off you. They've taken away your power. So we say to people, protests are always a springboard. They're never an end in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they're a springboard to setting up your own system. For, so, for example perfect example of this when we started setting up our own common law courts and investigations in canada and we served summonses on the heads of these churches they freaked because they 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 we were outside their controlled court system we were we were like renegades mavericks operating on our own they didn't know where would strike next and that panicked them uh there's nothing they they there's more than a loose cannon somebody mm -hmm. who can't be controlled can't be bought can't be kind of it's it's all designed to take us down these false dead end routes right um, that deplete us that deplete our 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 hopes and our energy well we never let go of that we never let go of our our sovereignty in that we we always set the terms of battle and that's another very basic sense of teaching whoever sets the train of battle will always win no matter how small they are if he, he has this famous saying Battles are won and lost before they're ever, ever fought. And that's because whoever defines the issue and determines the battle um, will win. Because then the enemy, even though they're huge, has to respond on our terms. 
-hmm. So like in Canada, we, we didn't, like the system was saying, children were abused in these residential schools said, no, they weren't abused. They were murdered. They were tortured. They were raped. They were killed. It was genocide. Mm -hmm. And after a while of us using those words, after 15 years, the country started using them. Now everyone talks about genocide, mm -hmm. right? And that was just a few of us. So it proved his point. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls it the chi, which is a, a, a chi like is the essential energy of a situation. He says, if you control the chi of your opponent, you'll win, even though you're, they're huge. If they control their, your chi, they'll win. And so we define the term, we define what the issue is. We set up the taint during a battle. We make them come to us. We never go to them. Mm -hmm. And that we run workshops in that. And, and it's kind of a, a new idea for a lot of people, but it's how we train people. And then they go out and try it and come back and say, yeah, it worked. <laughs> Good. It often worked. But you have to uh, be brave enough to try it mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and persistent enough, right? How often do you give these workshops? Oh, regularly. It's what I, a lot, a lot of what I do these days in person and also online. Um, that can be set up. Just, uh, just write to me and we'll set it up. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, there's lots, but I mean, this has really been good. And I would urge people, if they want to contact me, it's angelfire101 at protonmail.com. And uh, by decree.com has all my books. I do a Sunday blog show, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern, every Sunday at bbsradio.com slash here we stand. And all the archive shows are up there. We go into a lot of these different issues and things. Um, also, our site for the Republic is Republic of Kanata, K A N A T A, Republic of Kanata.ca. And we have a lot of documents in there about, you know, setting up own systems of, of self-governance and that um how to go about it so i mean that's um kind of the general message is don't wait for somebody else do it yourself unite mm -hmm. with others and let's work together because th th these are crimes that are hitting everybody now right mm -hmm. yeah there and people have to understand that it's hitting fathers and mothers it's not a gender yep. type of thing no. we have to stick together right. and work together yep I'm glad you said that. I agree totally. Well, I'd like to have you back on as a guest. Sure. In the future. That would be great. Okay, so uh, uh, don't jump off. Slam the Gavel's a podcast to help the public understand what really goes on in the family courtrooms. I'm your host, Marianne Petrie, author of Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth. Please join us again here with Kevin, Annette, and other guests. Thank you again, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.